Hallelujah. We give you all the glory, Lord. We thank you. We come before your throne in the precious name of your dear son. And we just say thank you, God, for bringing us through another week. Oh, we honor you today. We honor you in the beauty of holiness. We say great is your name. Greatly are you to be praised. Oh, God, we thank you and we honor you for your dear son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sin. And so, God, we just honor you. We begin our service, God, just to tell you thank you to tell you how wonderful you are, how matchless you are, how majestic you are, how awe-inspiring you are, how awesome you are, how marvelous you are. You have done great things and it is marvelous in our eyes. And God, we just thank you for how you've kept us this far. We thank you, oh God, for how you've kept us even in this season, oh God. Oh, we cling to you like never before. We wanna say thank you for being the go-between. We wanna thank you for stepping in between between, oh God, us and tragedy. Oh God, we want to say thank you for who you are and what you've done. We bless you. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify your holy name for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. You are king of kings and you are Lord of lords. Oh God, we extol you. We lift you high. We magnify your name. We bless you. Oh Holy Spirit, we ask that you have your way here this afternoon, that you would do what you want, whatever is on your agenda for today, God. We pray that you would accomplish it. We thank you that your word goes and goes out to do whatever you send it to do. And so, God, we place our faith and our confidence in you. We thank you while we are in our homes blessing you and glorifying you. God, we cannot come together physically, but Lord, we come together online to bless your name in one accord. Oh Lord, we bless you. We thank you. All the earth will shout your praise. We will declare the name of the Lord. We bless you, God. We honor you. Have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We bless you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that you would just open up the windows of heaven, God. Oh, we honor you. Wherever you are, just clap your hands. Come on, do it again.
Oh God, you're great. We say great are you. Death could not defeat you. You are great. Great. grave could not hold you. Oh, great, yeah, yeah. Great are you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you. El Elyon, the Most High God. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise and the honor. holding anything back we're not holding anything back from you we declare that you are the most high and above you there is none you set the moon and the stars and the sun in the sky you are the great creator of heaven and of earth the earth is at your footstool we bless you we worship you in the beauty of holiness even now right where we are Oh God, would you just move among your people? Move, rest, remain, breathe, pour over your people. Bless your people. Some of us are brokenhearted in this season. Some of us are afraid in this season. But God, help us even in the myriad of emotions that we feel, help us to declare that you are the most high God. We submit those emotions submit to you. And God, we pray that as we submit it to you, God, that you will replace it with faith. Faith that would move mountains. Oh God, faith that would deliver. Oh God, we thank you and we bless you. You are the most high. Jehovah. You are the most high. You are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. We worship you now. You are the most high God. Jehovah. You're mighty in battle. You never lost. You are the most high God. Jehovah, Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah Adonai. Jehovah.
invited us into your homes to share with you. Our prayer is that this service be a blessing to you and minister to your heart. I want to just give you a special thanks and appreciation for all those that have been supporting us and all those that have been standing by us. We thank God for you and for what God is about to do with us and through us. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll be reading from verses 20 to 31. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be reading from verses 20 to 31 from the New King James Version. Amen. <clears throat> the word of the Lord goes as follows. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for the other. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after the miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. Bow your heads as we pray this afternoon. Eternal and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity this afternoon that you've gathered us together, oh God, to just dig into your word. We ask you, God, that your word today inspire us, that your word today uplift us, that your word today empower someone that is listening today. Have your way in their lives. Have your way, oh God. We ask you this afternoon to speak to us, to send a word from the throne room of grace, oh God, and fill our hearts and our minds with your love and your compassion that you have towards us. Embrace us with your love, oh God, as you sensitize our ears to hear your voice and no other. We thank you for all these blessings. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Glory to God. You know, we previously shared on the gifts of the prophet. We shared on the gift of discernment, the gift of the pastor, and the gift of the teacher. Today, we will be looking into the motivational gift of administration. The motivational gift of administration. Our reading this afternoon begins with Paul stating... But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. Just walk with me through this. I, I realize something. I realize more that the, the more and more you study God is the more and more you realize and discover how amazing our God is. Our God is amazingly awesome in our lives. And the more and more you study him is the more that you realize this. God is not a boring God. God is not a common God. God is a God that is full of diversity. If we look at the multiplicity in creation, the amazing, amazing galaxy, 
the planet that we live in. Psalms 19, 1 tells us the heaven declares his glory and the firmament shows his handiwork. The magnificent variety we find in nature, it shows that God is a God of beauty and color. He's like an artist that expresses himself on a canvas with blending of beauty and color and shades. Our God is not a plain God. He's not an ordinary God. He's not a tasteless God, but he is a God of splendor and majesty. It is an interesting thing that if you were to examine any part of God's creation, the beauty of God's creation, if you was to examine it, you will realize that it can be broken down into small little pieces. Any of God's creation that you examine, you will find this, that, that it can be broken down into small pieces, individual pieces, small particles, atoms and neutrons and protons and molecules and microscopic matter. This big, beautiful thing that you're looking at can be broken down into so many small, little parts. Does God do this to show division? No, actually, it's the opposite. He does it to show his creation and its beauty and uniqueness. Everything that we look at can be taken apart into parts and members. Paul looks at God's creation, the, the human body, which is a, a beautiful creation of God. It's complex. It's full of diversity. But this creation, the human body, is something that is beautiful. Paul begins to point out the differences in the human body or the different parts, if you may. In verse 21, he speaks of the eye and the head and the feet. Paul communicates that every part of this body is important. It's many members, but it's just one body. Then he begins to look at the body of Christ and draws a comparison. And how the body of Christ is also has many members. It's something beautiful. It's something that God made, but it, it's something that's divided into parts. It has many members. It has different people and different gifting and different cultures and different shades of color and different languages. But when it comes all together, it's something that God loves dearly, his ecclesia. His called out one, the church of the living God, the body of Christ, something that God has created and he loves. Paul communicates the different parts of the body of Christ. In short, Paul is instructing us to love and appreciate our differences. His focus is not on the things that we agree on or the things that we all have in common, but he focuses on our differences. He gives value to our differences. There is value in our differences. This is the reason why there is no need for competition. There is no need for uh, debate in between who's better and who's not because God has made us all different. Someone say different. And when we bring our differences together, it makes something beautiful in our eyes. And truly, the body of Christ is something that is beautiful. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. One of those gifts that makes up a part of the body of Christ is the gift of administration. I believe this message will bless those that have that gift of ministration and also bless those that do not have it because there's so much that we can learn from the operation of this gift that can make us better people. The word administration comes from the Greek word kubernesis. It means actually someone that has been given a delegated 
given delegated authority to steer, to steer a thing, to guide a thing, to lead a thing, to work towards a goal, someone that knows to organize and how to plan and now how to put things together and lead a group of people towards a goal. Administrator is someone that we find very interesting in Scripture, for we find some administrators throughout the Bible. One in particular is Joseph. Joseph was an administrator used of God to take the people of God through a famine. We find Daniel, which was a great administrator. We find Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was called to be administrators. But this afternoon, we would like to focus our attention on a great administrator we find in Scripture by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an amazing administrator that we could learn so much from. Nehemiah was King Xerxes' cupbearer. He was a normal guy. He was a, a cupbearer for the king. And one day, Hanani, his brother, came by with some friends that was visiting from Judea, and they came to have a talk, to have a conversation with Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, you know, when you connect with old friends, you want to find out what is going on back home. Nehemiah asks the question, so how is things in Jerusalem? And they begin to explain the situation in Jerusalem. That the city is burnt down. The gates are burnt down. The walls are damaged. And the city is in disarray. Immediately, Nehemiah became heavy and burdened down with this news. Many of us could probably relate to this because when we connect with people, we want to find out what is going on back home. We're from another state or we're from another country. We ask, what is going on back home? And it, it, it was sad in us to hear that things are really bad back home. And that's the news that Nehemiah received. He received news that things aren't going good back home. The city is in disarray. And this man of God, this administrator, carried this burden for over four months. Four months. He carried this burden. But the thing that I love about Nehemiah is that he was a person that didn't have the money, he didn't have the resources, he didn't have what it took to fix this problem. But you can see that Nehemiah sat down and began to plan. You see, an administrator is a visionary. They see what needs to be done. What will it take? They set goals. They have a burden on their heart. They will put things in place when it concerns timing and placement and budgeting and staffing, they would devise a rough plan in what is necessary to accomplish or to reach a goal. An administrator usually has a plan. Usually has a plan. King Xerxes asks Nehemiah, what is wrong? After four months of Nehemiah carrying this burden, he asks him, what is wrong? Because he realized that Nehemiah is not himself. Nehemiah is a happy guy, and he's just not himself. What is going on, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah begins to share his burden with the king, that his home, the place where his ancestors lay, is in disarray, and the city is burnt down. The walls are damaged. And the king began to share concern and willingness to help Nehemiah. So Nehemiah began to share his plan. He said, I'm going to need some things. I'm going to need help. 
I'm going to need men. I'm going to need letters for, for the different governors so I could pass safely and freely. I'm going to need you to write a letter for me to get material that is necessary to build back this Well, These are all the things that I'm going to need to be successful in this endeavor that I would like to do. Nehemiah knew what was needed. And I believe that Nehemiah took this waiting period, this, this four-month period of waiting to map out a plan. This four-week, four-month waiting period was to map out a plan. What are you doing during your waiting period? Nehemiah was mapping out a plan. Habakkuk prayed and God told him to write the vision down. It's very important that when God is dealing with you with something that you begin to write it down. How would you expect someone to help you achieve something or accomplish a goal if you haven't even written it down yet? So I want to encourage you, those that want to do big things for God and those that have a burden to do something, you begin to write it down. No one will invest in an undeveloped dream. No one will invest in an undeveloped dream. A dream has to become clear. It has to be a vision that you can articulate. So I want to encourage you to start writing. Start writing what you need to do. Start writing how you need to do it. Start writing how I'm going to start this thing, how I'm going to build this thing, how I'm going to finish this thing, how I'm going to make this thing better, how I'm going to get out of debt, how I'm going to purchase my home. Begin writing the thing and planning the thing in your time of waiting. Begin writing complaining can't fix anything complaining will never change anything daydreaming will never change anything blaming others will never change anything feeling sorry for yourself will never change everything you need to pray god give me a plan i need a plan lord nehemiah prayed every step of the way and god revealed himself to nehemiah our prayer should be, Lord, give me a plan. Give me a plan for my career. Give me a plan for my education. Give me a plan for my family. Give me a plan, oh God, for my finances. Give me a, a plan for my business and my spiritual growth. God, would you give me a plan for my future? Lord, give me a plan. That was Nehemiah's desire. God gave him a plan to rebuild the wall. I want to declare to you, sometimes when you don't have a plan, you feel worthless. Sometimes when you don't have a plan, you feel confused. When you don't have a plan, you feel lost. So I want to encourage you, begin to pray and ask God for a plan. And when he gives you that plan, begin to write it down and be able to articulate it. Secondly, administrators enjoy delegating tasks and supervising people. They enjoy giving work capable people to capable people that can accomplish the goal. They have a gift of breaking down major goals into small assignments and small stages and small goals to reach the larger goal. They're gifted to break things down into smaller pieces. The Bible tells us that when Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, he made no announcement. No one really knew why he was there. When he arrived, he began to walk, and scout, and assess the damage. He went and he looked at the walls, he looked at the gates, and he assessed all the damage for further planning. He said nothing. Then when the time was right, Nehemiah called the people to come of Jerusalem. And he began to communicate his plan on rebuilding the wall. He began to encourage the people that this was a great work for us to do and it was the work of God. That this would be God's desire for us to build back the city of Jerusalem. And he encouraged the people and got the people on board. 
He was burdened. That mighty Jerusalem was exposed. And the walls was torn down. So he communicated them, let us rebuild. Let us rebuild because a city that is exposed is in danger. A city that is exposed is vulnerable. So let us build back the walls of Jerusalem. He began to encourage them. Reminded of the second part of that verse in Habakkuk where it says not only to write it down, but it says make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. So Nehemiah not only had a plan, but he knew how to articulate it and how to explain it and how to share it to others that when they grasped the plan or got the plan or got the vision, they could run with it. He got a team together. These people began to work. You see, Nehemiah had a burden to do the work, but he could not do the work alone. He needed a team. You see, a burden is transformed into beauty in team. Well, somebody need to tweet that. A burden is transformed to beauty in team. There's something beautiful to see when there's a team at work. All of the parts are coming together. It's like an oil machine. It's like something that, that's, that's harmonious. It's, it's like the coordination, the beauty. It's something that just flows. Good teamwork is something beautiful to see. We see it in sports. We see it in music. We see it in factories, in construction. When teams get together and begin to build and begin to be creative, it's, it's something that's just beautiful to see. The efficiency in something well organized is something wonderful with team. To begin to see people complement one another is something beautiful. Team is something that is beautiful. But Nehemiah did a thing that was so difficult to do for an administrator or even for a leader. A very difficult thing to do. Nehemiah took the burden that was on him and he transferred it to a people or a team, something that's not easy to do, to have a burden, to carry a burden and be able to transmit it or transfer it to others. Very difficult thing to do. And the reason why it's so difficult to do is because the first thing that people are going to tell you is that they have their own burden and they have their own troubles. And they don't have no time to follow you. It's an issue we have in our cultures, an issue that we have in our churches, it's an issue that we have in our businesses. Everyone is quick to say, I have my own burden, I have my own vision, I have my own dream. But Luke 16, 12 teach us. And if you have not been faithful, and what is another man's? Who will give you what is your own? It's actually saying, if you're not sowing faithfulness into someone else, others will not sow faithfulness into you. If you are not faithful in what pertains to another man, who will give you your own? Some people, the only time they're willing to sacrifice, the only time they're willing to do something for the cause of a vision or a burden is when it's their own. It's sad, but many people do not move unless they're in charge, unless they're the one with the, bur bur with the burden or they're the one with the vision. People don't move. 
They may give 50% of themselves, but they wouldn't give 100. The only time they give 100 is when they're in charge, and it begins to question their motives and who they're really working for. But it's not unlikely that when you put together a team that you have some that will give 50% and some that will carry the burden and, and, and do the work, but you have some that would do very little. Nehemiah even experienced this. The team began to slack. The Bible says that when they were working and began to build the wall, that the area got consumed with garbage. Somebody was dropping the ball. Somebody was slacking. Somebody wasn't doing their job. Some team member wasn't doing their job. Garbage began to accumulate, and garbage is something in any building project that gets in the way. It becomes an obstacle. And the Bible says that those that had the burden, those that was faithful, they became weakened. They became weakened because the other team members wasn't doing what they needed to do. See, the job of administrator is pretty difficult because you have to get people to do what they don't want to do. But Nehemiah continued to encourage the people and to uplift them and to, to pray for them. And they continued to build the wall with all their difficulties and their ups and downs. The work continued and the work advanced. And when you're doing a great work and the work is continuing and the work is advancing, you're going to get God's attention. But I want to declare to you that you will not only get God's attention, but you're going to also get the enemies. Attention. You're doing a great work, you're going to definitely get the enemy's attention. Thirdly, a good administrator is willing to endure criticism, distractions, resistance from haters, persecution to accomplish the goal. You need to understand that enemy's attack is just an indicator that you have become a threat to the enemy. It's just an indicator. I don't know who that word for was for, but I believe that word was for somebody out there today. That is just an indicator. The attack that you're going through is just an indication that you're a threat to the enemy. The enemy actually launched a full-scale attack at Nehemiah and the people of God. A full-scale attack used people like Sambalit and Tobiah that began to criticize the work and say, if a fox goes up on the wall that it will fall down. I mean, they say, what you're doing is insignificant. What you're doing is not important. What you're doing is not stable. What you're doing is a joke. What you want to accomplish, you'll never accomplish it. You'll never be who you believe that you're going to be. You'll never accomplish your goals and your, your dreams. You'll never accomplish it. That's what was the voice of Symbolic and Tobiah. That what you're doing is weak and you're wasting your time. The enemy began to intimidate the people of God with fear. And this is a tactic of the enemy. They began to threaten Nehemiah and tell them that if they don't stop, we're going to attack them. You see, one of the enemy's weapons is fear. The enemy didn't attack Nehemiah, but he intimidated him and built fear that he will attack most of the time when people find themselves in that situation they get scared and they quit they quit the work they quit building they quit the growth they quit pressing because the enemy comes in and intimidates them intimidates them with fear and threatens them but I want to encourage you not to stop Whatever God has put in your heart, continue to move forward, continue to build, and understand that there's no weapon that is formed against you that will prosper. 
And if God is for you, who can be against you? Don't let the enemy intimidate you from reaching greatness. Don't let the enemy stop you from accomplishing your destiny and your purpose in life. Glory to God in the highest. Then after the enemy didn't stop there, the enemy began to send letters to Nehemiah, messages. Told Nehemiah, won't you come meet with us? Let's have a conversation. The desire was to trap him and to kill him. Nehemiah responded, said that, why should I leave what I'm doing and come to you? I'm doing a good work. I will not come down. And that should be our response when we're working and doing something great for God. We're too busy for foolish conversation. We're too busy to fall into your trap. He said, I'm doing the good work and I can't come down. Well, it didn't stop there. They sent another message to Nehemiah saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go to the authorities and we're going to tell them that you're building this wall because you want to rebel against the king. And Nehemiah even though he knew that they were lying, he began to worry just a little bit. And the enemy sent another phase of attack. He sent a false prophet. And sometimes the enemy would do that. He would send someone that sounds like they're godly and it sounds like they're giving sound teaching and sound information, but it's a trap. This false prophet began to encourage Nehemiah was to go into the temple and hide himself. Just what the enemy wants you to do, wants you to hide yourself, wants you to run and hide. And it sounded like it would be something that made sense, but it was a trap of the enemy. The enemy didn't stop there when the workers were leaving the job site and some of them lived outside of the walls. When they went home, when they were coming back, they sent people to discourage them from going to work, to discourage them from building. The enemy attacked in every shape and form that he could to stop the work. But Nehemiah and the people of God kept building. The Bible says that they had the tools in one hand and their weapons in another hand. They continue to build, but they were ready to fight. They was ready to fight for what they believe in. Administrators don't mind to work. and They don't mind to fight. Nehemiah rose up. In chapter 4, in verse 14, and he said, And I looked and I rose and I said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. Fight. And I want to encourage you today that you get your fight back. I don't know if the enemy got you down. I don't know if the enemy has you discouraged. But I want to encourage you like Nehemiah the administrator. And I want to declare to you that God is for you. And because God is for you, greater than he that is within you than he that is within the world. I want to encourage you this afternoon that you stand strong and you stand against the evil workers. You stand against the naysayers. You stand Stand against the gossipers and the haters and your enemies because God is with you. I want to encourage you, keep on building, keep on fighting, keep on climbing, keep on believing God. Glory to God. In closing, we could clearly see after the walls were built, there was a celebration. People of God was excited. See, a ministrator usually work until the job is done. 
The wall was completely built. The gates were built. There were no entrance point that the enemy could come. The city was protected. One thing about an administrator, when the job is over and complete, they feel good of their accomplishment. Because from the time they received the burden, the only thing that has been before them is finishing the goal and completing the task. So they feel good inside. Administrators feel pleased when the job is complete. They are finishers. They were able to see all of the little things that they worked on, that they invested in, that they pulled together the people, the material, the fights, the struggles, and they were able to see it all come together in completion and be something that was beautiful. This reminds me when I was a young man, I was about 20 years old. My mother always desired that I study law and I be a lawyer. But at that age, I really wanted to be a builder. I loved construction. And I did little jobs here and there for myself, with my dad, and for other people. But a job came up, one of the biggest job that I've done at that time. It was a fire job. It was a neighbor that their upper level got totally burned out. Caught a fire and the place burned down. And he was willing to give me the job to renovate this entire floor. And I was excited. Excited. It was such a big project for me. Never did something at that magnitude, at that size, at that time. So I got the contract and I began to work. And I saw this place that was burnt and ugly and undesirable begin to rebuild. I begin to transform into a beautiful apartment, beautiful kitchen with new cabinets, beautiful bathroom, beautiful floors and beautiful walls and a beautiful paint job. And when the job was complete, I was so happy, I was so proud. He didn't have anyone to rent the place and I still had keys. I, I, I used to go I, and I took a few of my friends and I took a few people, my family members, and began to show them this renovation, this job. And it, and it felt good to put together all the pieces, put together the workers. I had a carpenter by the name of Salasal, pulled him together and other men, and pulled the material together and all the things together to transform this place into something beautiful. It was a good feeling. It causes me to understand God a little bit more when it comes down to Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says that after each day that he created something, created the heavens and the earth and created the vegetation and the animals and even man, after he created it, the Bible said that God looked at it, said this is good. God was proud of his creation. That he put together all the pieces, all the molecules and all the atoms and all the things and made something beautiful. He made something beautiful in man. 
in human beings. And this is what I believe Paul is trying to communicate. That God takes pleasure to bringing things together and making something beautiful out of it. I believe that God's invitation for you to come to his kingdom is an invitation and a call for you to bring your differences and to bring your uniqueness to the table. God is calling you to come, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, wherever you're from, whatever your color is, whatever your creed is, God is calling us to come together because he has a building project in mind. He wants to bring together all of the pieces like a divine administrator and make something beautiful out of it. God wants you to be part of his kingdom and he's calling you. He wants to make something beautiful and he wants you to be a part of it. He's calling you to come and be a part of his kingdom. He's bringing it together to make something beautiful and he doesn't want to leave you out. I believe right where you are that God is speaking to you. And I don't want you to miss this opportunity because God is calling you to come to him. With all your differences, with all your frailties, with all your shortcomings, he's calling you to come to him because he wants to make something beautiful out of you. He wants to take all our diversity bring us together with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. He wants to take all our diversity, all our differences and bring us together like the beautiful stars of the sky and make something beautiful out of you. Would you bow your heads as we pray? I'm trusting God that God is going to help you and God is going to lead you and steer you in the right direction that you need to go because he's that kind of God. Let us pray. Father, we come to your altar of love and mercy with a humble heart, God. Touch your sons and your daughters right where they are, Jesus. Touch them right where they are. We acknowledge you as our king and we surrender to your authority. We surrender to your guidance, to your direction. We ask you, God, to lead us and guide us today. Take the steering wheel, God, of our lives. Oh, gracious God, and navigate us to our purpose and to our destiny. Father, where you lead, we will follow. Help us to be better people. Help us to be better planners. Help us to be better organizers. Help us to be better team members. We promise you today that we will not quit, God. We promise you today that we will continue to stand. And we will continue to fight the good fight of faith. For you have not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind, oh God. Will power, love, and a sound mind reign in our hearts and our spirits, God? We will not allow the enemy to stop us or hinder us from completing the assignment you have given us the completing the assignment that you have over our lives. We will rise up as sons and daughters, knowing, oh God, that you are with us, knowing, oh God, that you are our strength and our shield, and that you are with us. Help us to be finishers and not quitters, that we will bring your name glory. You will be pleased, God. Step back. And look at us as individuals and say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
And look at us, oh God, as a body and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Father, we pray these blessings in the matchless name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for it today. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Good afternoon, Emmanuel family. Thank you so much for joining us throughout our service on Emmanuel Live. We get really excited when we see you on Facebook or when we see you on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for joining. Right now, we have officially arrived at my favorite part of the service, which is where we get to give. So wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to just take out your phone, take out your laptops, and get ready to sow into this ministry. When you sow into our ministry, it will not be in vain. You will continue to pour into this building and this community where we try to serve the Flatbush area, the Flatbush community, and we keep our building running and functioning so that when everything is over, we get to see you again. So remember, we have three different ways that you can use either Zelle, PayPal, and we also have text to give. So that information will be coming on the screen now. Also, if you probably don't prefer to use technology, feel free to write a check and mail it to Emmanuel Church of God at 1365 Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11210. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for this amazing week that you have brought us all through. In spite of everything we may be experiencing, you have been by our sides. You have been there to comfort us, to guide us, to direct us, to give us wisdom, and you have never, ever left us. You've never left us hungry or without. So we thank you for your provision, and just like you provided, Lord God, we're going to take that love and that action and pour it into your ministry, into your work, and we pray that every single seed that is given today is blessed, is multiplied, and that you will use it for a great purpose. We thank you so much. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is it.
God bless you once again, Emmanuel family. It was so good to be with you this afternoon. We are excited about what God is going to do in your life. God has called us to come together to do something beautiful with us as a whole. And we're trusting God that God has spoken to you and that your lives will never be the same. If you're listening to us and you say that I need a difference in my life, I, I want God in my life, and, and you never accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, I want to give you this opportunity before we close. I want you to repeat this prayer with me, this simple prayer, and ask God to come into your heart. I want you to say, Dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your goodness towards me. I ask you, God, to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I confess you as my Lord. I confess you as my Savior. And I thank you for saving me. And I thank you for helping me live a life that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you said that prayer, we want you to reach out to us, either by way of email or telephone call. Just reach out to us so we could pray with you and believe God that he's going to do great things in your life. We love you, and we're looking forward to see you really, really, really soon. Let us keep praying that God is going to bring us together again real soon. Come on and lift those right hands with me as we close our service this afternoon. Thank you again for being with us. Put those right hands in the air and repeat after me. And by this shall all men know that we are his disciples if we have love one for another. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you soon. We love you.
Thank you.